Chautauqua is made possible by the Maryland Humanities Council, Montgomery College, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, I'm Angela Rice Beamer here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College for a living history program called Chautauqua. Chautauqua gets its name from Lake Chautauqua, New York, where the first Chautauqua was held in 1874. It's changed over the years, and today Chautauqua is a humanities program where scholar actors portray individuals in history who've made a significant impact on the world. This year's theme is the War of 1812 in Maryland. Tonight's Chautauqua character marched British troops into Washington to burn the Capitol, the Supreme Court, and the White House. Tonight's Chautauqua character is British Major General Robert Ross. Good evening, my Maryland friends. I am pleased to be here with you, my friends. I am Major General Robert Ross of His Majesty's Army. I am here today as a soldier, not as a diplomat. I am here to speak with you, and that is why I have come, not in my uniform, because I know how our, what do you call it, red coats excite you so much here in America, but I've come to speak with you. Now, let me preface by saying I have been a soldier my entire life, has been devoted to the king and to the British people, to defending their interests at all costs, in all ways. When I was age 15, I started my career as an ensign here in this country when <clears throat> you were but colonies seeking independence. The last two years of your rebellion I spent here as an ensign, and that is where I learned to try to speak your form of English. <laughs> because I know as well our proper English speaking is something that excites you as well. <laughs> For the last 10 years, I have fought Napoleon in Egypt, Italy, Holland, France, and Spain. I would prefer to be fighting Napoleon again today. I was unfortunately wounded and sent home to recover. And once I did, they assigned me here. Even though I believe Napoleon is the greatest danger that faces the world, and I mean both America, your country, and my country of Britain, I have been set here because now we are no longer friends, but we are enemies because your president, James Madison declared war on our country and made us supposedly enemies. Your President James Madison declared war and then rapidly sent forces north into Canada to burn and sack the city of York, burned it to the ground, stole everything that they could take and injured women and children in the process. This is your president, little Jemmy Madison's way of making war. Let me make it clear to you. I believe both our nations should be fighting Napoleon, not each other. However, I am a British officer and my duty is to protect the king and his interests and the interests of the people of Great Britain and our empire, no matter what, and no matter what my feelings might be on the matter. 
I am here to try to impress upon you good people that you either deal with me today in the next 12 hours, specifying that you will come to an armistice and that you do not, you people of Baltimore, agree with your president and his declaration of war, or we will burn Baltimore's military and public buildings just as we did three weeks ago in Washington City. That is your choice. Let me put it a simpler way. Your choice is to speak to me today about armistice or face Admiral Coburn tomorrow. Admiral Coburn, if you don't remember the name, is the man who has spent the last year burning and destroying communities around the Chesapeake. Admiral Coburn has a great proclivity for fire. He was with me in Washington. So you either deal with me or deal with him. But before we come to that, perhaps I can persuade you that peace is the better course. Now, Jimmy Madison, I don't know if you've seen him. <clears throat> we can't seem to find him anywhere. We stopped at his home while we were in Washington City, and he wasn't there. But Jimmy Madison has charged that war was declared in part because of British impressment. Let me deal with this canard. We have never, as he claimed, impressed American sailors into the British Navy. What we were doing was, of course, taking British seamen who had deserted their ships, deserted their country, betrayed their country, and fled to your navy for better pay and better rations. These are not American sailors. They are British citizens who have committed an act of treason. I'm sure Mr. Madison did not specify that. And what does it say about you Americans that you embrace men who commit treason in their own country to join yours? Did you not also have a Benedict Arnold? Is this a haven for that kind of lack of character? Let's go further. He also said, well, they are American citizens because when they came to us, we granted them citizenship. My friends, that may be how you see it. That, however, is not British law. Under British law, if you are born a citizen to England or Scotland or Ireland or any of our holdings, you are a citizen for life. You cannot negotiate it away. You may move to another country, that is your right, but you do not cease to be an English citizen. And whether the United States has offered them citizenship or not, that is your problem, not our law. The heights of James Madison's arrogance that he can tell us how we will handle our nation's interests. And then I give you one other thing which he shan't mention. Did he attack England or the empire on the seas where we were supposedly impressing his sailors and taking his ships? No, he attacked Canada, our province of Canada, sacked York because his interest is primarily to take Canada away from the British Empire. I bet he did not communicate that fact as a cause of war. His lack of character is overwhelming to me. 
But perhaps these legal issues do not induce you to think of peace more than war. Let me speak of war. Your Navy, well, what there is of it. Old Ironsides, wonderful vessel, a frigate, very quick, took two British ships, did it not? Now where does it reside? In a harbor, protected. It cannot go out because the British fleet sits upon it. Your Navy consists of 20 ships. The British Navy consists of considerably more, a thousand. Your USS Constitution has, what, 24 guns. A ship of the line of ours has 74. Your Navy does not really exist next to our Navy, but yet James Madison has recklessly put you on a course. And what has happened to your country? Since he declared war, trade is completely stopped. You can't ship out any of your goods because your ports are closed by the British Navy and we're not even using a quarter of it here. I do not agree with Admiral Cockburn. He said to me, <clears throat> do not fear the American Navy. The men are but a handful of cowards and ruffians. Speaking of cowardice, let me speak of your military, your army, or lack thereof. Jefferson and Madison, little Jimmy, believe in no military at all, if I am not incorrect. And what has that got you? You've received no army. You have a militia. Brave men, yes, to be true. Probably good shots. But yet, it is almost the height of criminality to put such men into modern warfare where they stand shoulder to shoulder, lines of men aiming their muskets at other men 30, 40 paces away, firing away at each other until one side shakes. Being able to be trained to maneuver shoulder to shoulder, to know that each man will do his duty, that he automatically and instinctively knows how to maneuver, so you make your lines move to take advantage of any tactical mistake by the enemy. The militia knows nothing of this. So they fire one time and retreat from the field. They are unfit for modern warfare. I shall demonstrate the example of the campaign on Washington. Now, I do not wish to get too much in detail, but three weeks ago, August 20th, we landed at the community of Benedict on the Patuxent River. We unloaded our army of 4,000 men and proceeded up along the Patuxent up to Upper Marlboro. In three days, we proceeded forward, and your militia offered us two things. Two men came to meet us. Of course, they said they, when we captured them that they were not militia. They said they were out hunting squirrels. You Americans have some curious habits, but I had never noticed that you hunted squirrels in such a fashion. I don't mean with the muskets, their muskets came with bayonets attached. One was left to realize that they were chasing squirrels with bayonets. Hardly an excuse warranted well there. We arrested them and put them in chains. Not even good liars. But untouched, we came to Upper Marlboro. And then, of course, the next day moved on to Bladensburg, and there was the American army of 700 trained troops and 5,000, almost 6,000 militia. More again than half our force stood in front of us. But of course, in the span of four hours, even though we were, they had the heights 
There was a river in front of us, and so we had to cross on this small bridge, which constricted our men and left them easily to be shot down as they crossed the bridge. But we swept aside one line of militia, and they ran away. The second line advanced on, and we outflanked them, and they ran away. The third line, sailors under Commodore Barney, with 10 cannon fought gallantly until Barney was shot to the ground. Do not fear, we gave him aid and paroled him. He was a very brave man. He did not leave his guns until he had completely overwhelmed him. But the militia had run. One of my lieutenants said, you could see their heels so quickly. They turned heel and ran. He said, it was like the races, and the men started to call it the Bladensburg races because the militia fled so quickly, even though they had the advantage in terrain. Some of them, as soon as we fired our first rockets upon them, and I must tell you of our rockets, to be truthful, we have no idea where they're going when we fire them. But they make a great deal of noise. And if they land next to you, they will blow you apart. But when you fire them into now experienced troops, have no fear, because it's a miracle if you get killed by one. But your troops, as soon as we fired them over the heads, they threw down their weapons and ran away. Such is the state of your militia. It had been a long day, though, marching, I must say. The weather was more conspiracy against us than the militia. It was hot and vilely sticky and humid. <laughs> you people live in an interesting place. I do not believe I was hotter or more miserable in the Sahara, in Egypt. And then it rained and rained and rained. Your rain does not come down as in England in a nice fine mist. It comes down in deluge for an hour at a time, beating everything into the ground. We were struck by the great forests and the beautiful farms. I must say thank you for the hospitality of your farms because all of the wonderful fruit trees were ripe and my men enjoyed the fruit immensely because it was so hot and the dust that rose up. My men, by the end of that day, after four days of marching and fighting the whole day, were exhausted. Many wounded, we had straggled everywhere. So we waited for two hours. I was dreadfully afraid that General Winder, the American, would somehow gain the courage and get his militia together and attack us. But nothing happened for two hours. And so Admiral Coburn and I decided to visit Washington City that night. Two hours later, roughly around 6.30, we arrived. Under a flag of truce, the international symbol of peace, of a request for negotiation. At the second house we passed, two militiamen fired upon us fired upon a flag of truce, killing one of the men near me and killing my horse. Not only was this despicable display of dastardly intent, but that was the third horse that had been shot out from under me that day, and I was quite irritated. Well, after we dispatched these men, we waited. Coburn wanted to fire everything he could get his hands on, but we had been ordered to fire only military and political targets. So we waited. I said, surely someone will come. Someone from this great country will come to speak with us to save their community to even at least acknowledge us and say that they will oppose us. But no one arrived. Not Jamie Madison. Not any of his, what you call it, his cabinet. 
No one from your Congress in any way, not a single person as we waited 30 minutes and 60 minutes and 90 minutes and at two hours when your naval yard caught fire and burned everything to the ground because your sailors fired it, we realized the horrible truth. To me it was horrible to realize that there was not one person in the civilian government that you people elected who had the courage to stand his ground, to even come forward and negotiate with us under a flag of truce. Not one civilian official, and I reflect on if any British town was so invaded, there isn't a citizen of the town, much less an official who wouldn't give their life to protect and save their community but not Jimmy Madison. Well, by eight o'clock we marched into town and we commenced to fire your buildings. The Library of Congress, the Department of War, the, the Department of State, the Treasury, anything we could find. We did, did not burn the patents office because a Dr. Thornton came out with courage and conviction and said that the patents office was not really a public building. It held in there the ideas and values of humanity. He made such a great argument. We left the building stand. But of course, we marched on to your Congress. Let me say two things about this. First, I was struck that the fact that your House of Representatives is a much grander room than the House of Commons at Parliament. Further, your Senate is a, such a regal institution. The building is such that it puts well to shame the House of Lords in Parliament. I was fascinated by the fact that this society, this country dedicated to the common people in charge, would build such an edifice of royalty for the legislature. It was magnificent. But Coburn climbed upon the dais and said, who shall vote to torch this Yankee house of democracy? This harbor of democracy, all say I. And the men yelled out, I. And they ripped down the curtains and broke up the furniture and torched the building, put it to fire and flames. And then we moved on. Now, there have been reports of looting by my men. I must clarify the issue. Yes, there had been three incidents. One of the men we were not sure had actually looted. We found him inside a private building. We gave him a hundred lashes. Two other men we found with personal possessions in their, on their bodies. We executed them. They are a disgrace to the British uniform. And we will not tolerate such behavior. We are not a looting mob but the British Army. And I tell all of you that if you find a British soldier or officer looting, grab them up bodily and bring them to me and I will dispatch them immediately. It is not the way the English fight war. Now, just as we came to your, well, Jemmy's house, we stopped at Mrs. Souter's and asked her to cook us a chicken for dinner. She lives right across the street, and she said she would. She said it would take a bit, and we said, well, we have something to do. And at 10 o'clock, we walked over to Jimmy's house to see if he was home. He wasn't. He had left out a scrumptious banquet for us, Forty places set with the finest silver and 
silver and china and whatever else, and fine wines in Madeira, stacks of food which my men lit into without even refiring it. They were famished and ate it clean and drank all the wine. Very happy, one lieutenant said to me that it was divine providence that made Jemmy such a gracious host. And he was a gracious host. He, he gave some of his shirts over to some of my men to replace the rags that they were wearing after four days. Others took his hats. One lieutenant said, well, if we can't find Jimmy, we'll take his hat back to England and hang it. Lieutenant Urquhart took Jimmy's ceremonial sword. This is how quickly Jimmy left no rise to defense for the building, and we tore down everything and burned it, and then retreated to Mrs. Souter's house for dinner. I must tell you, she started to light the candles around the table so we could have illumination for dinner, and Admiral Coburn said, no, 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 no. Let us just dine by the illumination offered by Jimmy's house. The man had a particular reverence for burning buildings. We stayed through the night through another tempest of rain. The next day we went back and burned more of the buildings that hadn't completely burned. Of course, this led to the unfortunate accident. We had no idea that your armory, in the well by the armory, that you had stored gunpowder in the well. And one of the men leaned over with his torch to look down in it. A piece of it fell off into it. The explosion knocked down two buildings nearby. It put a hole in the ground 20 feet deep and 40 feet across. It ripped to shreds 20 of my men, wounded another 30. It was a sight I had never seen on a battlefield. Human and pieces scattered everywhere among bricks and debris, a thousand times worse than anything I had ever seen. This shook my men, I can say. And then a heavy storm came in, a terrible, terrible storm. And when it was over, I decided that the best thing that Winder might, by this time, must have his army back together. It had been two days that the best thing to do was to take my small detachment. I had only taken 900 men. And some of those men, as I said, to stop looting, I sent one man to every civilian home to protect it from any looters. So I really only had about 600 men left with me. I pulled them all back together. We banked up large fires to make Winder think we were still there. And in the rain at 8 o'clock, we moved back to Bladensburg to pick up my wounded and the rest. Four long days further, we arrived at Benedict. From the time of Bladensburg to the time we arrived home, back at Benedict to the ships, we saw not a single militiaman. Again, your militia seems to lack leadership or any kind of desire to defend their country. And so, after 10 days and 100 miles march, a great victory at Bladensburg, the burning of Washington City, taking 200 cannons and 100,000 rounds of ammunition, we boarded our ships. And here we are three weeks later. Hopefully this convinces you, not only questioning the reasoning behind the conflict between our peoples, but also the ability for you to do anything more than suffer in the conflict to come, if it is to come. I do not distinctly wish to take Baltimore, but I will if ordered. I have been told by some already that Baltimore will be different. There are 20,000 militia in Baltimore, one man told me. Mr. Key told me this the other day. The dastardly little man. 
came to me under false pretenses and then said he was here to get the treasonous spy, Dr. Baines, to plead for his innocence. Dr. Baines of Upper Marlboro, who I arrested because he had been shooting our stragglers, shooting our stragglers, often unarmed sick men. He shot them. He is of Scottish birth. That makes him a traitor to the crowd. But Key came to get Dr. Baines, and that's when he told me of the 20,000 militia. I told him simply, I will take Baltimore if requested, even if it rains your militia. And as another said to me today, a local, as my men have now found their way onto your soil, I not tell you where they are, but they are poised, all 4,000, to fall upon Baltimore if our talk does not come to a successful conclusion. But when we landed them, a fellow was there, and he said, General, you will have trouble getting to Baltimore. I said, Sir, the morning I start, I will guarantee you that I will eat supper in Baltimore or in hell. I'm Angela Rice Beamer, and I'm here with Doug Mishler, who's just performed as Major General Robert Ross. Thank you for being here again at Chautauqua in Maryland. It's always great to be here. I love it. Uh, we love having you here, too. Um, I, I want to ask you, why did you choose this particular character of all of the characters from the mm -hmm. War of 1812? Why did you choose this one? Well, I really like it because we have an alternate view. Um, at first, we, we were talking about a character, and they wanted me to do something, and I thought maybe um, some American naval leader or something like that, one of the admirals off one of the ships. And then it came to me, how about the fellow who burned down Washington, D.C.? And then we had to go figure out who that was, because no one knew. Uh, we went, who, what's his name? I don't know. And so we had to Google up burning of Washington and found General Robert Ross. And now that I'm doing him, I'm really enjoying it because it does bring that alternate viewpoint of the war, uh, of what they saw as the reasons for the war, the causes of the war, and the validity of those reasons, and also their side of why they did this dastardly thing of burning down Washington City. I think it's very important to, to have that alternate view, and many of your characters mm -hmm. bring that alternate view. How long did you study this particular character? Uh, there's little. We don't have, if there are original papers, they're hidden in England. We have some accounts, some of the things that he wrote to other officers. Uh, one of his aides wrote a book or a large manuscript uh, about him. Uh, so I've read pieces of that that pertain to him. Um, and of course, since he was only in the country for about five weeks, uh, there was less to focus on in that regard. Uh, but I also spent a great deal of time studying the tactics on Bladensburg and the burning of Washington. And some of, went back to some of my old books that I'd studied for the War of 1812 in general about causes and events of the war. So, How would you describe the core or essence of this particular character? Hmm, the core, the essence. Uh, I'm sort of doing him as in a way, a reluctant uh, warrior. He's clearly a warrior. He wants to fight. He will fight if ordered to fight. But he also thinks that the war is not in the best interests of either country. Uh, clearly not in the Americans' best interests. Clearly not in Britain's. He's more concerned with Napoleon. Uh, and, and that he, he really had a desire to try to find a way other than arms to settle this, um, even though that's not really his job. His job is just to follow orders. And, uh, and that's the center. I tried to get him having that arrogance of a British officer, determined to do his duty and confident that he will carry it out. And yet a man who, on another hand, feels that, why are we doing this? It seems like not the best thing to do. It's not a wise war. The Americans have made a colossal mistake here.
So there's a quote I found, and I unfortunately can't remember mm -hmm. who to attribute it to, but it, it is that it was a hot and unnatural war between kindred people. I like the quote. Yeah, it really is a tempest in a teapot. It's a it, the causes were probably just as one man tonight asked questions about the impressment would if British ships were being British sailors being impressed by French ones wouldn't we consider that an act of war uh, great question um, they are clearly significant but really it is such a war that didn't need to be fought at that particular time over some vague causes and other historians have looked at it and said yeah but it's really not about impressment it's about gaining Canada Others have said it's it's about moving the British out of the West and moving the Indians out of the way because the British had semi-supported the Indians, moving them out of the way so we could expand further. So those are not the noble reasons of defending our people uh, and free trade. And some of the free trade arguments are a bit specious as well. So the um, Native Americans were active I in the war and, mm -hmm. and sort of what happened at the end of the war the, the, in terms of the stalemate and, yeah, and, and the, how the, the, the Native about, Americans. Yeah, the, the basic truth of this war, a, a bit like the Revolutionary War, the Indians are the huge losers of this uh, because the British do ultimately, even though we d they don't sign a paper saying we're not going to impress your sailors, we're not going to stay involved in the forts, they just basically stopped doing those things. Um, and the Americans basically start to expand and start moving the Indians out of the way by one, one means or another. Mm -hmm. And the Indians lose ground. Tecumseh and those Indian tribes are, are basically massacred. Eh, maybe that's too harsh of a word, but certainly their power is broken. And of all, and Britain really loses very little out of the war. England gain, uh, the United States gains a great deal of, of self-respect and identity. And the Indians lose basically everything. Yeah, so. the, the, the American army sort of came of age and it, such as it was, but yeah. uh, yes. because Britain was such a huge power and the United States starting out rather unorganized. Absolutely uh, unorganized, <laughs> yes. I was being kind. Uh, the Navy was pretty good, but too small very, very tiny, and it couldn't do much. Uh, and the American army was led by some very, very bad officers at the start. And then it started to get better. It got its feet, and Stonewall, uh, Stonewall, Andrew Jackson did a very commendable job at New Orleans. I, I'm being careful there because the British also acted rather rashly and stupidly at New Orleans, but... But again, with that arrogance that they could just brush aside the American militia and, and what little army there was. So, but the army did grow stronger, yes. That so, was a long answer. It's okay, it's okay. So the, 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 when the United States invaded Canada, mm -hmm. they got about a mile and a half in, is that correct? Or I think little, they get further than that. A little further that, than but, that, okay. But they invade, they're successful, they burn down York, which is now Toronto. Um, and then they're quickly pushed aside, but there's many battles on, on the lakes and cross-border skirmishes and that as the war goes on. So that is actually where most of America's trained military resides. The interesting thing is the militia might have been more effective had they been led better, but certainly the American army would have been much better had they been led better at at the start, the leaders are terrible and make mistake after mistake. Hull was one of them. I don't know his, his title, but I think his name was Hull. And they oh, yes. Did, uh, yeah, Hull, <laughs> Winder in the Washington, D.C. area. Winder, General Winder was the one who led uh, at Bladensburg and was quickly <laughs> set adrift. But then he shows up in Baltimore again. And I've heard, I, I read one book that said, called him the hero of Baltimore. And I went, well, but he really doesn't do anything. But so. Was, was James Monroe, I'm sorry, not James, James Madison. Was mm -hmm. James Madison at the Battle of Bladensburg? No, I, I read one book that said Monroe was nearby. Monroe. Uh, Monroe was scouting and things like that. There were some, as I remember, there's some cabinet members were nearby up on the hill. 
but as the engagement became active, they were gone. But no, I, I don't believe Madison was anywhere near it, but he might have been. I'm not an, I'm not an expert on, on Jemmy, as the British called him. There seemed to be no love lost between no. Ross and, uh, and Madison, even if Madison even knew about it at all. No, 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 yeah, of course they never met. Uh, but the British were fairly demeaning of American leadership. Um, and of course, James Madison being a bit smaller, being little Jemmy, and uh, you know, armies tend to do that to each other. They make fun of the leaders and where they can, and, and little Jemmy making so many mistakes. And then leaving Washington unprotected was just beyond the pale for the British. They lost all respect, especially Ross lost respect for him was, uh, because of that. Was he, was uh, Ross criticized for not burning the town to the ground uh, by sort of sparing the private homes rather than the federal? No, that was the general order was to burn the public buildings and military targets, not to burn private homes. Admiral Coburn is sort of, he's sort of the advanced of total war that will crop up more in the Civil War with Sherman and Stonewall Jackson and others where you have to take the fight to the enemy. And if that means burning homes, that's what you do. And uh, Coburn wanted it, but uh, Ross does not want it. Would have done it if ordered, I'm sure, but he was scrupulous to try to protect the homes. and. And again, Coburn, when they entered the city, said, let's burn everything. And because they fired on the white flag and, and Ross said, no, no, we will not do that. And even protected the homes, as you say, sending out troops. In your presentation, you talked about uh, the, the, the burning of Washington and uh, the uh, person at the patent office. Mm -hmm. Dr. Who's, Thornton. Can, can you tell... Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, there's not much to say. It's, it's a roundabout thing. I don't know if there's a story from Thornton's standpoint, but Ross speaks of coming to the patents office. They're getting ready to, to, to burn it down. And Dr. Thornton comes running out, apparently, from the building and makes a very impassioned plea that the burning of the building will not deprive the United States of any kind of military information and that really this, the patents office holds ideas and holds designs that will uplift and help humanity. Uh, and so this is a vital thing to human culture. And Ross says, well, okay, that's a noble thing. And they walk around the building. They do not burn it to the ground. So again, showing that Ross, I don't think, ever had any interest in burning private homes. He, you know, clearly you could call the United States Patent Office a government building, but he, he spared it, so. Were there any that you know of, any uh, important American documents that were taken by the British when they came into Washington? None that I know of. They speak nothing of that. They take, they're very unclear about what they take with them out of Washington. They load up a bunch of carts, get some old horses, and carry things away. They do not specify what they are. The only time he specifies is when they arrive back at the ship, he has 200 cannons and 100,000 rounds of ammunition. Now, maybe that's what's in the carts, because they did loot the armory. But, and he wasn't looting private homes, and I mean, they took some shirts and hats and that type of thing from Jemmy's house, uh, but nothing there's no discussion that they take pictures or art or anything else. They burn it. So we don't know that he carries off anything, though people have said that uh, Coburn carried things off, but I don't know what that would be. And Dolly Madison got the picture of George Washington. We think. I mean, that's what? sort of a folk tale. We're not sure. Some historians argue that was someone else carried it out. Some say it was a militiaman. So we don't know, but it's become the American story that Dolly herself carried it under her arm. What was the makeup of the crew on British ships at the time? Uh, were they somewhat international rather than uh, only well, British? International in the sense some were British, some were Irish, <laughs> some were Scots, uh, some were probably Hessian as well, some German. Uh, there were certainly people from all over, um, but primarily British 
citizens, primarily British citizens. Uh, it was a tough, hard, horrible life being on a British ship. The American ships were bad, British ships were terrible. And that's why British sailors, if they came to American port, jumped ship and swam away. And if an American ship came, they would probably get better treatment, better food, and better um, pay. And so they did it quite often. Um, it was a, a difficult time. That's where the word press comes from. The press gangs were gangs of British sailors who would go into pubs or along waterfronts and press you into service by finding people who've had one too many, knock them over the head and take them bodily and you wake up in the morning and you're inside a British warship at sea and you're now part of the British Navy for an, in, an indefinite amount of time. Wow, wow. Well, thank you so much for being here. We've enjoyed it again and hope you come back soon. It's been fun. Always. Uh, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. You've been watching Chautauqua, the War of 1812 in Maryland. I'm Angela Rice Beamer. Good night. <laughs>